Thanks, Rav. Uh, and hello, everyone. Hi to our panellists and hello to our participants who we can't see, unfortunately. You're uh, locked um, and a bit invisible to us, but we know you're there. We can see there's um, 33 of you so far. I'm sure we'll have some more arrivals soon. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our webinar on the topic of using data visualization dashboards to track and drive social change. It's quite a bit of a mouthful there. Um, I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm joining you from, the Iraqwa people of the Bundjalung Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to uh, pay my respects to the elders of the lands that you're joining us from, wherever they may be, um, both past and present as well. So, um, my name's Cam Elliott, and I'm the head of the academy at Clear Horizon. Uh, Clear Horizon's a consultancy. We're based in Melbourne, Australia, and we're dedicated to supporting change makers with co-design and evaluation solutions for people, place, and planet. And our academy is all about taking the skills and knowledge that our consultants have built up over about 15 years and translating that into uh, really practical learning opportunities. We deliver courses in a range of topics. Our biggest course is uh, measurement, evaluation, and learning. Uh, we are just running our first online uh, version of that at the moment, and that seems to be going really well. A lot of people having um, a lot of great insights uh, happening there. We also run courses in most significant change, uh, data visualization and reporting, uh, which is the topic of this webinar, as well as evaluating systems change and place-based approaches. Uh, so a quick overview of how the webinar is going to run today. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our panelists. So you can see there on your screen. Uh, and then I'm going to throw open to a few questions, uh, sorry, throw a few questions to our panelists uh, to get the discussion started. And then we're going to open up to some questions that we've received uh, through the registration process. Uh, and finally, we'll have about 20 minutes for open questions that you can uh, drop into the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So how that works, uh, click on that box. Uh, you should be able to type in whatever question you have. Alternatively, if there's a question you see there that you like or, or that's similar to the question that you're going to ask, just upvote that one. And the questions with the most upvotes uh, we'll prioritise at the end. If you have anything you want to say to the panellists as, as we go along, just little comments or you want clarifications of any points, uh, just drop them into the chat as you normally would in any Zoom session. So uh, we'll also be recording the session. Um, and we'll be sending that out on social media as well as via email uh, to everyone who signed up. It's now my great pleasure to introduce you all to our three panelists for today. Uh, joining me, we have uh, Jen Riley, our Chief Innovation Officer at Clear Horizon. You can see her waving there. Georgia Vague, uh, a Senior Consultant in our Social Innovation Team. And lastly, but definitely not least, Mike Honey, a uh, Data Integration Visualization Consultant who's joining us from Manga Solutions. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I might start with you, Jen, just to help us get to know you a little bit better. How and why did you first fall in love with DataViz? Well, I, about seven years ago, um, people from the Magnolia Place Initiative, which was a collective impact initiative, came over from the US and shared with us their measurement system. And part of their measurement system was this amazing dashboard. Uh, that showed their short-term, medium-term and long-term indicators. And I, I just remember being, you know, blown away by seeing all this measurement in one place. And it was dynamic. You know, this thing was live and the data was real-time and they were using it uh, to inform, um, you know, what they, what they were doing. And, it, and I think it, it just really appealed to my sense of accountability and transparency and equity, all of those things that we hold dear in the sector. And as evaluators, we're constantly taking data, but here was the data being given back to community and back to program managers that were able to see the data and adapt their behavior based on what the feedback was. Like one of the feedback was their experience with the doctors and saying, well, I didn't have a good experience with the doctors. And then that data being used to improve things. So that really was the beginning. And I was in love but, uh, at that point, I think. I just, you know, I, I basically my whole career trajectory sort of changed. And I even went ahead and set up my own business around the whole process of creating dashboards. It had such an impact. That's where I got to meet Mike many years ago. Thanks, Jen. It looks like we're being joined by a few uh, ghosts sitting in the background. I think we had Kim. There's, who's also there's a few, a few Jenny Rileys out there. Yeah. 
you're cloning, Jen. Um, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't distract too many people. You can choose your view if you want to just view one participant uh, or one panelist, I should say, up in the top right corner, click on that and you can just see the gallery view, which is, sorry, the speaker view, the only person who's speaking. All right, so uh, Georgia, have you always been um, a data nerd or is this a more recent kind of discovery for you? Um, well, yes, I definitely don't have a, 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 a history that the three Jenny Rileys on screen do um, at the moment. I'm more, I'm newer to the uh, database club, so it's only probably been about the last oh, 12 months I've been uh, starting more on the database journey. And I think the thing, the biggest thing that appealed to me um, from the beginning was I'm not a particularly mathy person. I'm not a particularly numbers person, but it was a way that I was able to engage with data visually and be able to understand the trends that I was seeing. Um, I'm definitely a visual learner and it was a way that I was able to make sense a lot of the information that I was reading or seeing um, in a way that was a lot easier than previously. So, yeah, I think my, my takeaway is that it's not, data is not as difficult um, as it could be um, when you have you know, visual attached to it. Mm. That's a pretty key message. Thanks, Georgia. Don't be afraid um, if you're not a maths guru. For sure. Mike, um, what excites you when it comes to data viz? Um, Cam, what's exciting me these days is the, the possibilities that have opened up because um, previously it would have probably been six-figure investment to get started on a project to build a data viz solution. Now the tools are free. There's data everywhere. Um, so we've got kind of the opposite problem of what do we need to focus on? Um, what's essential to carry the message? But yeah, uh, it's been a very exciting time. So my background's been more in um, the big end of town and higher education and finance. But when these tools came along about five years ago, I was able to um, pivot my direction in a similar way to Jen and see, well, let's get into things that I really um, enjoy making an impact in, which is uh, the social change space and conservation. So just um, so much data and so many projects to work on. It's an exciting time. Absolutely. It's super exciting that those tools that were previously locked away, you know, in the top end of town are now available to everyone. Absolutely. Great. Thank you all um, for helping us get to know you a little bit better. Um, we've done a little bit of analysis uh, on our back end to see, find out a bit more about you, our audience members. Um, and from the data we've collected, it looks like, you know, you're, you're, strips, you're spanning the level of experience right from beginners up to quite advanced uh, data viz um, experts. So we're going to do our best to cover the basics as well as some more intermediate and then some more advanced topics. And apologies if my the background is a little bit noisy. There's a, a tractor driving past. Hopefully that he doesn't circle back and keep going on. Um, a caveat just at the start, uh, we won't be walking you through how to build a dashboard from start to finish. Uh, that's not really feasible in an hour's time. Um, if you're interested in taking a deep dive into that process, uh, your best bet is to jump into our six week course that I'll tell you more about at the end. So our first question uh, is for you, Jen. What the hell are dashboards? <laughs> what are they? Okay. so. Um... Stephen Few wrote a book back in 2006, which was one of the very first books called Information Dashboard Design. And he described, and I'll share my screen, um, he described them as a single screen visual display of the most important information needed to achieve one or more objectives. Um, I, I would probably add a bit more to that definition these days and say that, you know, they they're, they're dynamic. Um, the way that he describes it could be an infographic. You know, it could be just something that it has all these static things. But I think what's special about dashboards is, is the fact that they change, that they update, um, that they update in real time. But also users can, can inter interface with them and use drop downs and slices and filters so that they're able to self-serve uh, the information they need. So I think that's... Um, Part of that, that, that definition is that, yes, they're on a single screen. Yes, they use visualizations such as graphs, histograms, um, line graphs or maps. You know, they have these visualizations, which are often called um, tiles. You know, you have different tiles in a dashboard. 
And the idea is that it quickly communicates information. Dashboards should answer a question um, and it, it should be really quick to, to make sense of. They shouldn't be too busy. Um, I guess I'm going into good practices of dashboards, but basically a dashboard is, is an on-screen, ideally one page visual display of data um, through different, different data visualizations, as I said, um, but they are, they are dynamic. Might why they add to that. Yeah, I'm just wondering why they're particularly useful um, to social impact initiatives. Well, I think one of the key things is that we, oh, here we go. I'm giving you a bit of a, a bit of a, a why. Um, I think they are really important because they communicate. And I think social initiatives especially, I mean, you know, we, we need to know what's working and what's not working. And, you know, so there's critical information of, of share uh, stakeholders and audience. And I think, you know, we need to be able to um, do this quickly, but we also need to do it in a way that we, we, we only, you know, we collect once and we report often from the same set of data. So I think what's awesome about dashboards is the process, which is sort of what I was showing with this, this in the background, is that you've got a dashboard, but it's also what's underneath the hood. And I think this is what's important about a conversation about dashboards, is that you should have your data system set up underneath in such a way that you can query data and produce multiple reports. So for instance, we've got a one, one source of truth for one of our clients, Windana. And from that, they have multiple dashboards. They have a dashboard for their client level, their program level, and their organizational level, pulling from a single source. So that's a really important thing, I think, for, you know, with organizations with low resources, they're always spending their time doing data reporting. They actually want to set up automated systems that gives them information when they need it. So I think that thing about I've written up here is streamlining uh, monitoring, evaluation, learning data, automating, standardizing it, you know, getting it out. And also, you know, social initiatives more than ever, you know, and we should be, um, learning what's working in these complex environments, pivoting quickly and improving practice. So I think, um, you know, in, in a time where resources are shrinking potentially, being accountable about what's working and also being able to change it up. So, you know, I, I'm very passionate about accessibility of data in this day and age. Absolutely, thanks Jen. Do either you, Georgia or Mike wanna weigh in there? Um, I might just add, I've never heard the under the hood um, analogy there. And I think that's great because I think there's so much that sits underneath it. Here, here, here is a, a dashboard that's seen by, you know, one party, but then actually underneath it, there's so much more involved in the background, which can involve multiple different reports for different stakeholders. But I feel like also might represent all of the relationships and things that need to be built in the back end to make it happen as well. Absolutely. And from my perspective, the integration piece traditionally would have been a separate set of tools and a separate set of specialists and a little project on its own. Whereas now we've got the opportunity for uh, one person using one tool to pull all that together. It's obviously a lot quicker and um, more responsive to feedback. Mm, absolutely. I'm going through a big uh, integration project at the moment. I can tell you it's painful. So it's good that that's all dealt with up front. Um, so it's back to you, Mike. What trends have you been observing lately in dashboards? Um, well, it's just uh, like I mentioned earlier of um, fire hose of data coming out and increased openness, I think, driven by the, the pandemic. And maybe if I share my screen, I can show a couple of examples. Uh, yeah, please do. There's um, a massive uh, global survey that's being run. Is that coming up? it is yeah that's great yeah um which covers like uh, like all so many countries and even down to state levels so um you can compare states and at the same time there's data on um covid cases is very open as well so you can really quickly pull together data from different open sources at an incredible level of detail so this is based on um a survey that goes through uh, COVID symptoms, but also people's responses and attitudes towards them. So what sort of behaviours have they been engaging with or not engaging with? So for example, 
uh, they ask a series of questions around mask use and so you could compare say what happened in New South Wales um, in the recent wave against Victoria. Um, really just amazing uh, detail of data that's um, being publicly available and um, there's other cases that are perhaps more simpler like our local um, Victorian Health Department has been putting out a list of um, exposure sites which is quite difficult to use. Um, you've got some, it's alf sort of alphabetically by suburb and then there's different dates and so on in there. So I've been running a little project to turn that into a um, Power BI dashboard where the data is presented spatially and as a timeline Ooh. and it's interactive. So um, if you just perhaps wanted to know a more recent period of days, you can quickly filter to that or we'll zoom in on an LGA and get down to the actual um, details. So just a couple of examples, uh, a big, really complex example, and then a um, smaller one that's a lot simpler. Um, but I think they, they too, in contrast, show some of the potential where there's open data around um, and there's great potential with these tools to turn that into useful information. And the audience, I think, is really hungry to have that interactivity and have their personalized view of the information. Do you have any examples, and maybe not with that particular data set you're showing there, but any examples where this data has been used um, or how it might have been used? Why was it wanted? What benefit did it create? Um, well, the benefit with that last one I was showing um, was for accessibility. So I got a lot of feedback when I was pushing that out from uh, people that were vision impaired or um, people with various disabilities that was a lot more accessible. Uh, they might have found some people with certain disabilities might have found the um, the map a lot more useful than a list of suburbs and addresses. Um, other people were interested in being able to focus um, just on a limited set of data on the particular area that they were living in, for example. So have a lot simpler, not, not be confronted and overwhelmed by so much information. Um, mm. So I think that was probably um, the best example I could give there. Yeah, great. So the ability to zoom in and zoom out depending on your needs mm. from the same data source. Yeah, yeah. So uh, all the different, serving a lot of different audiences and people with different interests from the one data source. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Georgia, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in developing place based uh, data dashboards for MEL purposes? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I haven't been in the game as long as um, Jen and Mike has, but I was lucky enough to last year be involved um, with Go Goldfields, who are a place-based initiative uh, based in Maryborough, which is in the central Goldfield Shire in northeast Victoria. So towards the uh, last half of 2018 and just at, prior to COVID, I was working down there for three days a week, um, basically working with the team, um, assisting them to identify relevant indicators um, helping them collect relevant data and set up uh, data collection systems that would feed into their data dashboards. So Go Goldfields are a um, long-standing place-based initiative looking to increase positive outcomes for young people in the region. I might quickly, because we're all loving sharing at the moment. Um, I'm not going to stick on this for too long, but basically we made four um, dashboards. This is one of them. This is a children and families um, focused one. So all together, they're quite different to, one, to the ones that um, Mike was um, showing. So you can we see- can't see your screen just in case you're thinking we can. Oh, <laughs> I was, thank there you. There we go. Thank you, Sam. Down. There we go. <laughs> Perfect, looks great. <laughs> yeah, children and families partnership one. So they're quite, they're quite different um, to Mike's. Uh, th this one here, you've got, you know, the short-term things that the initiative were trying to shift the dial on, so um, service referrals for um, young parents. Um, and on the top level, you've got some population level things that they were trying to shift, prep literacy, children living with family stress, developmental vulnerability. And then there were four of these dashboards with nine indicators each. So I might, I might come back to that um, later. But yeah, I've been working down there and it was a really great experience. Mm, sounds great. What, what challenges did you face when you were down there in particular? Uh, I feel like there are a couple of challenges working down there. I think one of the biggest ones was um, the fact that I'm an external consultant 
coming down there. Um, I don't have any pre-existing relationships um, with the community. Why should they trust me? Um, they don't know who I am. Um, and so a lot of the challenges were around, I really had to um, work to build a lot of relationships and work really closely with my counterparts um, to be able to build those relationships and gain the trust of the community down there. Um, another challenge was definitely um, getting access to some data sets. So um, getting access to some state level data sets took quite a work, quite a lot of work. Some local level data sets took quite a lot of work. So yeah, a couple of challenges. Mm. Any tips you can offer on those two things, how to overcome them? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, tips, and I'll probably chat about this down further, but having the community lead and decide what they want to be measuring, I feel like is one of the biggest success factors that allows um, place-based initiative to be able to get these dashboards up and running because if the community have chosen what they want to be measuring, you're so much more likely to have the support and their advocacy in collecting this data, setting up the data collection systems and getting the dashboard operational. Mm, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and could you kind of walk us through what, where do you tend to start when you're creating a dashboard? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, so in the case of the Go Goldfields one, so yep. Yeah, first step touched on already, basically uh, helping, like making and ensuring that this is something that the community are wanting because there, is, there are agreements that sit behind it. There are um, different stakeholders, different organisations um, that sit behind the dashboard. So they need to all be working together with you in order to get the information to the dashboard. Um, uh, next, um, what I would do is probably revisit, and, and what we did do, um, was revisit how the initiative were wanting to create change within the community and then work with the community um, on how they wanted to measure that. So what that looked like in practice was um, a large community workshop uh, where we revisited the theories of changes of each of the areas and decided um, as a group what kinds of information um, or data uh, we, that were going to indicate to us that they were making change in the areas that they were wanting to make an impact on. Um, so, for example, and it was on what I just showed before, but uh, one outcome they were trying to achieve um, was uh, children and families were actively engaged in early learning. And so, as a group, they decided that prep literacy um, was going to be a good measure of this um, because the assumption is, if children and families are increasingly participating and engaging in early learning, um, the assumption is that prep literacy um, will increase. So we did that for all of the 36 indicators that we were wanting to come up with with the community. Um, and then basically from there, it was about um, finding if that data already existed, um, so if there was pre-existing data, or if we needed to set up a, an extra data collection system to be able to collect that. So for the example of the prep literacy data, um, we knew that state schools were already giving this data over to the state government and so that's when we had to start working with state government in being able to access this data. Fantastic. Thanks for walking us through that, Georgia. Uh, do either of you, Jen or, or Mike, want to add any more there around you know, the steps that you tend to take? Um, well, I walked alongside Georgia on that on that project. And I think, yeah, getting getting clear on what questions you've got. So are we making an impact? What type of impact for who? And mapping out that theory of change. So, so much work happens before you even start mocking up dashboards, um, getting, getting clarity around what they want to measure being, being really, really important first and, and having those workshops. So there's that sense of ownership, I think is really important. But yeah, that was, I mean, that's, we've replicated that process in a number of organisations as well as place-based. Uh, you know, working and co-designing those solutions with people because they're often collecting a lot of data and this is probably something Mike can say as well is that there's a, often a lot being collected and it's just not being used. So, you know, working with what they've got. Mm, great. Yeah, the, the um, theory of change I think is really crucial as well from my perspective as a tech, coming out from a technology standpoint. There's just so much data often around, but yeah, what's what's really important to present and to get mm. down onto that single page as Jen was mentioning it in the introduction that's yep. really important to just get those most useful metrics out there mm, honing it down to the most critical information you need great 
Um, we touched on the, the barriers or, you know, what got in the way. What were some of, some of the successes in that project? Well, I think getting it up finally was a huge success, just considering how many stakeholders had to be involved and how many emails and meetings. And it was just such a great process to go through. Um, interesting, though, I was I called Go Goldfields um, a few days ago just to check in to see what they've been doing since and how they've been. And one of the great successes that I feel like has come out of it and kind of came out of our chat um, was that they were saying that it's shifted the conversation up there around a few things. So it's been able to highlight where there are definite gaps and put in people's faces, here are some of the issues that we really need to address as a community. It's put it out there. But then on secondly, it's also shifted the conversation around how data can create change in these communities. So we're seeing there's an issue that's here what potentially, here is evidence saying that we're not doing so well in this area, what is now an intervention that we can put in to hopefully shift that dial? And then if we do do that intervention, is that changing the way that our measurements are going to go? Was that with the employment data, Georgia? I remember something, like one of the graphics was about employment and they were tracking the number of jobs advertised in community and there was this amazing you that was shown through the COVID period. Yeah so because this all got finalised probably the week before um, COVID hit, um, two of the things we'd already set up in the region were the amount of jobs um, that were available in the region and so automatically that was set up we could see that you and the other one um, which are quarterly um, data that's released by the um, department was about young people accessing um, support payments. So that's also that was also a system that was set up prior to COVID that you were able to just watch this, yeah, trend. So pretty amazing. Yeah, it really sounds like it's it's fostering some you know very uh, helpful conversations as well. Fantastic. Um, Mike, you touched briefly, uh, you said that you're a, you know, a bit of a tech guru, so you might go there now. Um, why is there a clear preference, or for you, why is there a preference for Power BI as opposed to some of the other BI tools that might be out there? Yeah, sure, Cam. There's, yeah, there are a lot of tools, and if your data is nice and tidy, I think with most of them, you could just uh, jump in and start producing visuals if you know what you want to achieve. I think probably the clear difference with Power BI is the power that it has in the data integration and data modeling side. So once you get going on almost any project, you find like the examples that Georgina and Jen were just describing, there's data that needs to be integrated together from different sources and that it probably needs to be cleaned and tidied up. Um, so with a lot of tools, they don't really have much, they're just data visualization tools. They don't have much power in the data integration end. And so you end up asking for help from the data providers. You might need um, to get data specialists involved. And that's all a, um, a friction on your project and what you're trying to achieve. So Power BI makes it really easy, um, even for people who aren't technically, um, don't have technical depth when they come into it. Uh, you can edit the data uh, very quickly and easily, and it becomes a repeatable script that when the refresh process is run, like um, Georgina was, Georgia was mentioning previously, the new data just feeds in automatically and it respects all those transformation rules. So yeah, it's um, that's probably the key difference, I think, with, with Power BI and why um, I've been so focused on it myself. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so where do we all think the future of dashboards is heading? I might uh, throw to Mike here again um yeah i think it's a it is a new era it's like with the um covid crisis in particular uh so many people have been looking at data and dashboards coming to check it sort of every day or every week um wanting to filter it and interact with it and just see the information that they want so that's a huge change i think as the audience is suddenly now um, more engaged with data and data visualization um, at a much wider spread. And at the same time, it's opened incredible, um, it's launched incredible openness of data. There's so many projects now that are uh, exposing their data in detail, um, government organizations, uh, universities, and so on, um, the scientific community and their 
um, papers. There's a huge push there towards openness in data. So um, I think going forward, if we can hold on to those <laughs> those improvements, like to me, they're improvements that people are more interested in this and can uh, start to see their world in terms of data and visualization more. And um, then combine that with the theory of change, we can drive those uh, towards outcomes that improve society, improve the environment, etc. Sounds idyllic. Mm. <laughs> Fingers crossed it plays out like that. A lot um, of work to get there, but... <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Jen, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I'll, um, I think, I think as, as Mike said, there's this sort of big data and the proliferation of, of data coming at us and how, as the social sector, how do we leverage this information? So I think that that's certainly one thing is imagine a world where evaluators no longer go out and collect data. You know, we just use what's out there. And I think some of the examples that we're starting to see um, are things like, um, put my screen up here, but just so I can share this, but, you know, like with satellites and drones, like Mike has started to, uh, to you know, he's been doing a project with the Amazon using satellite data showing deforestation. I mean, that's, you know, and, that, and the fire work that you were doing using satellite imagery to look at, you know, burn sites and, and the use of drones in collecting data. We've, we've heard of things in international settings where they've used drones and satellites to actually see where human rights abuses are happening, where people have had their houses burnt down. So there's this data. So how do we, you know, we can put that through, through, through dashboards. Then there's things like sensors. I mean, this is the internet of things, right? So this is where, mm. you know, your fridge is talking to you and things like that. So you've got, you've got data coming through, say, aged care homes. So if someone falls on the ground, a dashboard that sort of says, right, there's somebody, you know, who's fallen there. Or someone hasn't taken their pill because there's a sensor in their pill thing. You've got mobile phones. You know where people are and what they're doing. So being able to use that. Social media metrics, Google Analytics, you know, so much data. So I think the future of dashboards for the social sector will be about accessing more of this, this big data that's available. And I, I've, got a, I've got a note here about privacy, and that's something we need to be very mindful is about the responsible use of data and also consent and ensuring that we're not accessing data unless we have permission to use it. Um, and, you know, we've seen how with sort of Cambridge Analytica that data can be misused, but also not just the collection, but also the analysis that we can do. And I also so I think one of the futures of dashboards is more the predictive analytics. And I think, you know, with the use of sort of machine learning and artificial intelligence, we've already seen some amazing dashboards that are coming out of America in the in the school system where they're able to track. And basically a dashboard early warning system goes off that if a child misses a certain number of days of school, we know they're more likely to drop out of school. And so therefore the social worker is able to make take action. So it's not just a data for evaluation, it's data for early intervention. So Sounds that's like the minority report, Jen. <laughs> that's right, that I'm a bit, of, bit of Tom Cruise doing a bit yes. of, you know, but Imagine we can harness that for the power of good. And I mean, I guess this is the thing is, is, is like any new technology, you know, even in the industrial evolution, how was, how was technological change being used for those in power and those without? So I think, you know, we need to be mindful, yeah, that, you know, that it can be used in different ways and in, in, in ways to, for people to get more powerful, but we can also use it for social good. And, you know, some of the things about apps where women have uploaded where they don't feel safe, um, you know, using geo mapping technology so that they could find out where to put lights in a, in a new city. There's so much potential here for the social sector. So I think, you know, I think these are the sorts of uh, future opportunities and, and we've had the, the opportunity to do topic modeling. We've had the chance to, to crunch qualitative data on a dashboard and Mike set up a topic modeling process by which we did thematic modeling. Um, so in other words, you know, we crunched the data into topics and the computer did this. We didn't have to sit there and do it old school style. So uh, many, many opportunities ahead there. Fantastic. It sounds super exciting. If we can, yeah, um, focus on the good rather than or maybe contain the bad or the evil. Um, just good, good, do good practice, I think, is, is, yep. is that whole thing of be, do, say, right? It's the do it properly and do it well. Absolutely. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so 
What do organizations really need to be thinking about or be aware of when it comes to developing dashboards? I might start with you, Georgia. Sure. Um, so what do they need to think of? Um, and yes, I think I've harped on about this enough already, but for me, it's definitely putting community um, in the centre of dash dashboard creation. I, especially, I think, inherent in place-based work is the community-led nature of it. And I think it's the same thing when it comes up to the creation and setting up of um, data dashboards. So, yeah, helping advocate uh, getting access to the data um, and also helping, uh, yeah, place-based um, place based initiatives be able to track their local impact. Um, so, like, and if I'm, I keep going back to kind of the prep literacy example, but if an initiative was looking to run, you know, a local um, campaign to get families engaging more in English homework, if they can, if they can start to, to, to track this and, um, you know, make a, insert an intervention in the campaign on literacy levels, they can see if that campaign did or didn't make an impact by being able to look at that. But I think that it, it comes back to the community leading that, knowing that it's an intervention that's going to work in their space and then being able to see if it was successful afterwards. I think that, I don't think it's that useful for, um, you know, consultants or funders to come in and prescribe indicators and measurements that um, place-based initiatives track. I, I just don't think it's a, it's a sustainable way of setting it up. Um, in terms of other recommendations, I'll just share my screen again quickly and I'll actually try to share it this time. <laughs> um, so can we see that dashboard now? Yep. Excellent. Um, so, firstly, I think it's really important in place-based work to have a mix of population level data and locally collected data that I touched on before. So, in this dashboard here, you can see for the top left, developmental vulnerability, um, that's AEDC data, Australian um, Education Develop no, Australian Early Development Census. So, that's um, data which is a national survey of prep students that's done every three years. Um, and on the top there, there's also children living with family stress. That's another um, population level data set um, uh, from the student entrance healthcare questionnaire, I think it is. Um, the population level data um, really useful because um, they're rigorous, they provide Victorian averages for comparison and have really big sample sizes. But then I think super importantly um, is the locally collected data. So if place-based initiatives really want to understand what local impact they're having, then they really need to set up their own locally relevant data collection system. So you can see here on this dashboard, so this first time parents group attendance um, tile that we've got down there in, in, in the bottom middle. Um, so an agreement was set up with the local maternal and child health centre to share this with us. Um, and also this kindergarten attendance one. So systems are still actually being set up to collect and report on the kindergarten attendance data shire-wide. So that's, you know, great. All of the um, kindergartens in the shire are trying to work together um, to come up with the same system to be able to feed data into this. So that's a work in, in progress. Um, but yeah, so having the, having the local level, having the population level, and then another recommendation, I think that it's important also, and this follows on from kind of my last point, I think it's almost important to put down indicators that you don't necessarily have pre-existing data sets for. So this means that what the community want to actually measure is driving the dashboard and not just what readily available data is then driving what's being measured. So I think, yeah, definitely recommendations um, and the things to think about, I think, are a, getting the community to decide what they want to measure. Um, through having a mix of population level and local level data sets, but then also having a mix of pre-existing data and new data collection systems. And really, yeah, making it contextual and locally relevant, I think is one of the biggest yeah, other best practices. Thanks, Georgia. You, uh, you did my job. I don't have to summarize what you said. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Jen, did you have anything to add there at all? Um, I am just responding to a few of the questions that have popped up online, which is which is awesome. Yeah, but, um, we, we had a question there about qual um, data, and yeah, are you able to share that dashboard you spoke about? Um, we had the, we, so this was the one that Mike and I worked on. I will share it. It was it was for um, a community project, and they were interested on 
alcohol in the community and they were collecting data by going out and having a chat to people about alcohol attitudes in community. It was, a, it was quite a small group, but we, we were able to um, build this because they were doing a sprint. So what was fun is as they were collecting the data, they were seeing the real-time data. So the number of conversations they were having, here you go, uh, the number of conversations, who they were speaking to. So, you know, was it male or female and age groups roughly. I think it wouldn't be so binary now, it was a few years ago, um, and how they were engaging. So they had a simple form, a Microsoft form on their phone. Um, and they were just having conversations and collecting the data on their, on their phone um, and trying to catch the comments verbatim. And so, you know, what were they hearing? Why do people feel this way? And, and then who should we continue this community conversation? So Mike, um, I'll have a look, go back here, but you can see here that there were key phrases that were taken out of each of the comments. So this was one of the comments here and then a number of key phrases were sort of taken out. Mike, do you, do you want to comment on a little more on the technical side about how what the algorithm was underneath that? Yeah, sure. There's a, there's a couple of steps to it. So the first was uh, the topic modeling to try and establish like sort of four or five themes across the, um, across the data that's being collected. So, we waited until we had a, a bit of a representative sample and then were able to run that and uh, iterate over that a few times. So the um, machine learning tools can um, do amazing things, but it also needs a bit of human interpretation usually on uh, what to include and what to exclude. And then having established those topics, we're then able to automate the process of analyzing every new um, response that was provided from then on and say which of these topics does it best fit into. So um, straight away you've got uh, an automated process that's that's turning that um, uh, record of a conversation into some uh, qualitative data. And then we sort of aggregated it into topics mm. and what we loved about this was I went oh well what are the what are the women the young women saying and then we got sort of a feedback on you could use the dashboard to sort of say, okay, so it's a culture, um, sort of this drinking for fun versus, you know, brain impact. But then, you know, what, what were the, I don't know, older men talking about? And they talked about social responsibility. It is a small sample, but I think what it did was gave us the capacity to sort of say, well, we can use this to make sense of the data, but also it gave us an, you know, an, over, an overall picture that we could give back to community. And we found this to be better because originally we started with a word cloud, which mm -hmm. isn't particularly nuanced. You know, it's sort of like, okay, well, that's that's helpful, but, you know, now what? And so when we had a conversation about what else could, we could do and we decided to use the sort of natural language processing and topic modelling, we were able to come up with, a, um, with this qual piece. So um, I hope that uh, answers that question. I can't remember who that was from, but that was, um, I hope that helps. Yes, I think um, that was GS. We don't have the full name. Thank you, GS, for asking that question. Um, it sounds like it speeds up what is otherwise, you know, quite a laborious coding and then um, theme thematic analysis process. So that's super exciting. Um, yeah, it absolutely is. There's a question here about um, your top tips for good data entry for getting the best data viz. Um, I I will certainly just sort of say. It, um, you need you need row level data, you need individual level data so that you can do granularity. So you've got that you can you can slice and dice data according to uh, location or gender or age. Mike, you probably it needs to be in a tabular format as well. Mike, what's what's the best advice? You want the best visualizations? How do we get the? What's the best way to have the data ready? Yeah, absolutely. Keeping it at the um, at the natural level of detail, I think, is really key. A lot of the time, we get given data that's been aggregated up, and um, you then can't break it down and, and analyze it in different dimensions. Um, yeah. So, yeah, being able to collect the data that doesn't mean you're putting it at that low level of detail, because obviously there's going to be um, privacy concerns there. But from a technical point of view, being able to have that flexibility when you've got the data at that low level of detail. There's a lot of mm -hmm. survey tools 
around now that um, as long as you're careful about selecting ones that do respect um, Australian privacy laws, etc. Um, there's a lot of good survey tools around that are quite easy for uh, lots of people to contribute. It's not really a technical task to design the survey. I think that's probably the, the leading choice is to, to find a good survey tool and spend a bit of time designing a good survey that's going to give you that detailed data. Test analysis. it. Don't you reckon, Mike? Test, test your surveys. Hard. Always yes. test your survey. We had a bit of a tricky one, actually, where we set up a survey, and I noticed that question was about data entry. We set up a survey and we had what's today's date, and we didn't use a date validation field. And so we had some people saying the 30th of MAR, some people saying, you know, the 21st of September, spelling it out. Some, You know, you can just imagine, you know, That's and it was like, oh, no. So when we came to aggregate that data, so I learned very quickly that data entry, the more you can um, you can control what they input into that form so that you get consistent data out the other side. So use the drop downs, use the, you know, open text data. It can be a bit of a nightmare to, to crunch. So if you can use uh, data um, entry fields analysis, so, you know, if, if it's an email address, make sure there's an app symbol in it, you know, make sure it's a certain number, if it's a phone number. There's a lot of tools, isn't there, Mike? And they're often inbuilt into survey tools these days to validate the data upon entry. You do that, it will be easier. So, you know, because if someone spells something wrong, good luck. It won't even turn up in your, in your data crunching. You just, you know, the, the system won't pick it up. You can do some cleaning, but basically the, the, the more control it is going in, the better it's going to be for you to do the analysis. So hopefully that, that answers that question. Yep. Great All right, point, Cam. Jane. <laughs> totally, totally concur with that. And as much as you can kind of yep. idiot proof whatever 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 the thing is to try to be able to get the, the right stuff, definitely yeah, data validation for sure and making mm -hmm. sure that yeah, I think the setup is is important for that. So getting that structure there in the first place. Great. Thanks, uh, Shona, for asking that brilliant question. Um we have a, a question that came through in the registration process that I really want to get to. I think it's uh, an interesting one. How do you orient decision makers and managers to the application and implementation of data boots? Want to have a crack, Georgia? Wait, sorry, could you say it again? I think I lost Yeah, my how, how, so basically how, you, how do you orient your key stakeholders, your decision makers, your managers um, to, the, to the dashboards? Ah, oh, um, how do we orient to them? I think, um, Encouraging people, well, if it's come from the community, obviously they're the ones who are going to be wanting to know where it is and then make decisions based off it. Um, in terms of orientating other people, like I know I'm having publicly available dashboards, I think is a really um, good and important thing in a place-based context. Um, it might not be appropriate in every context. Um, but having something publicly available that people often refer to, um, whether it's in meetings, whether it's in um, publications, but just uh, making sure it's something that's generally referred to and commented on could kind of orientate. Is that, does that answer the question? Yeah, it was about, yeah. Start, it about getting them on board to build the dashboards, like to sell, are you selling to decision makers to invest in dashboards? Yeah, I think, I think it's about the gatekeepers. How do you get across the gatekeepers? I think uh, it's a classic, classic business case, isn't it, Georgia? I mean, like once you, there's two big selling points to, to people really. One is around risk and if you say going back to the what's under the roof as well as what's on the show is if you say we're now going to securely store data in a one source of truth in a data warehouse so we're going to pop it all in the same location so it's secure you're not going to have any data breaches um, you're not going to lose any important data remember the days when we used to have surveys and filing systems you know God knows, by the way. Um, no, we're joking. Um, and then, you know, error, human error of data input. So if you sort of say, look, you know, we're going to reduce risk and also time. So Jira, who's a family violence service that we work with, every six months they ran around and created a report for the Department of Justice. Now, we went in there and set up what were the key indicators. So it was the number of women coming to their services. Where did those women come from? What were those women being referred to? Set up a dashboard. Now they just send the URL off to the department every six months and say, help yourself. They don't have to run around and collect that data. So those are the two big things, I think, for, 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 for managers and, and you know, CEOs and boards. 
boards are really easy because they really they want to see the data so they're really keen i think there's a bit of fear i think that's the other thing is that dashboards can be can make you very vulnerable it's all out there for everyone to see and i think you know that can be a bit scary so one of my things that i've been big on with with stakeholders is say let's just share a little bit of data let's take what we're currently using anyway that isn't scary that isn't going to you know and let's just see what happens if we put that data out and using a learning lens as opposed to a performance lens as well. I think it's about what if, if it's not showing what we're doing, why is it not showing? How do we make sure we get all our data here? If it's not representing the true value of our worth, then let's go and work out how to show that. Um, so I think you're always going to get a little bit of reluctance from some people because you know, they're going to be worried they're going to lose their jobs, right? If, if a data dashboard shows something up that's not, you know, very favourable. But I think it's got to be this, how do we improve? How do we mm. find out more about what we're doing? Mm. It's getting people to engage their curiosity rather than their fear of, of judgment. Yeah. Absolutely. And once people see dashboards, they're like, wow, this is amazing, you know, and get them excited, get them curious mm. about the data. And I think as well, taking people on that journey right from the start, like obviously with Go Goldfields, we had those um, community workshops right in the beginning, but then it was continually touch pointing with all of the stakeholders that are involved and kind of, you know, increasing that data literacy as you're going. So then the community who is being taken on the process is also becoming data, data literate in the process of building the dashboard. So when it comes up on the screen, people are aware of what's going to come and they know because they've been involved in the build. That's right, yeah. And just, I guess, gently, gently, slowly, slowly as well. Test things. Don't do a dashboard for the whole organisation. Maybe just start, start with one department. Find your um, your allies that you reckon, Mike, because always people that are willing to go on the journey and they're the ones who, you know, go with the coalition of the willing, you know, don't force this on people that don't want it. And then once one department's got it, and we've seen this happen in a couple of organisations, then the other departments go, I want one of them. And then so the snowball begins. So I think it's like any change management process, you know, find, find your champions, um, start small, prototype. Thanks, Jen. Mike, anything you want to add there? Um, it just to uh come back to the theory of change I think is a, a key way to um, engage with the stakeholders and reward them um, it's a way of structuring the whole project and effort including the dashboards towards the outcomes of the organization the stakeholders should be able to recognize what they see on the theory of change as yeah those are the things that we support and that we're all driving to and then even when you're down in the details of some individual visualization piece it should be relatable back to the theory of change and that's how you say, well, this is why we're doing this particular analysis. So you're giving it um, a reason, not just uh, as a technical exercise. Mm. Thanks, Mike. All right, we've got a question from Amy here. We've kind of touched a little bit on her question, but she wants to know how you create a dashboard to capture community voice narrative, in particular, how to capture language changes as different things occur or are implemented in the community. Any ideas about that? I think it'd be pretty similar to that qualitative one that we would do mm. in terms of collecting, um, if you want to see the change in language use over time, uh, is track keywords and phrases. Uh, social media has done a lot of work around this sort of sentiment analysis and, and keywords and phrases. So there, there is some stuff out there and the, and the language modeling is getting better and better. Um, Mike, what's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, it's it's picking up. It's a similar approach to what we use, but I, I'd suggest, but um, repeating it on a regular basis. So that project that we presented previously, um, the topic modelling was just done once at the beginning. Yeah. And it was kind of locked in, uh, whereas this sounds like something you'd want to be redoing, and the tools are um, open to doing that sort of analysis. So comparing the topic modelling for different um, sections of time and seeing what's changed. So you've mm. done some connections in with um, Facebook and Twitter over the years and, you know, Facebook's, you know, closed down a few of its data connections, but there's something called Supermetrics, um, which is worth people looking at and that tracks data. Of, the ideal scenario is if you've got a community group having chatter, like we've got a mum's group that I'm part of, is that if that group has consented to their data being 
uh, analyzed by a third party, such as your organization or, you know, ours, then go ahead and go wild, but don't do it unless you've got permission. But there are some, um, but those tools will enable you to look at those keywords and phrases as, as well, or, you know, as, as Mike said, there, there's some algorithms out there that help with that. Fantastic, Jane. If you can drop the Supermetrics link into the chat, that'd be great. Mm. Um, We've got time for one last very quick question, like 30 seconds each, and it's probably the most complex of all the questions. So this is an extra challenge for our panelists. Um, how do you build a dashboard for systems change in interventions? I uh, saw so we, yeah, you've got interventions that are not necessarily tracking change the same way, but there's coherence and lots of them happening at the same time. Really <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the first thing is starting with how, do you, how are you measuring systems change? So th don't worry about the dashboard at the moment. Go back to the, you know, your classic, how are you measuring your systems change? At Clear Horizon, we came up with a system, uh, a tool called SIPSI, which is, oh, help me, George, what's it called? Uh, changing um, the, um, S -I -P -S -I, yeah. S-I-P-S-I, which is basically about uh, moments of systems change. It's worth Googling, SIPSI. Uh, and if you're tracking moments of policy intervention and systems change, significant, that was it, significant instances of policy and systems change, if you're tracking those, you could definitely put that on a dashboard and say, you know, these are happening. And then you could sort of say, well, what sector is it by or what theme is it by or is it is it happening in government or local government? Or are you looking at, say, you know, the five R's of systems change? So you're looking at roles, responsibility, resources, you know, other things in the system. You know, are you looking at behaviour in key actors? Like, well, it depends on what you, you know, how you're measuring systems change. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we did, I'll just share this example really quickly because this was, this was a collective impact initiative, was that in a shared measurement system, not everybody measures the same thing. People can measure different things. So let me give you a very, very quick example because I think it's easier to visualise it than it is to... I know we're getting close to time. You've got 10 seconds, Jen. <laughs> okay, this is really, really fast. Okay, so the example I'm going to put up is in North St Mary's, we were all collectively looking to improve outcomes for children. So what... I think we've lost Jen. Jen's frozen. Oh well. We did um, was we said all gone ahead. Then underneath we had media frozen. You're back. It's all good. Okay. So in this example, we worked out long-term change and then short-term or medium-term changes, and everyone had a role to play. This is classic collective impact. The council was looking at books and stories and parent reading. United Way, who I was working with, was working on books and tips, so we were contributing to those outcomes. Okay, we're losing Jen. Jen, I think we're going to have to uh, um, end here and we um, may be able to share this example in the email that we send out. Um, thank you so much to our three panellists, uh, Jen, Mike and Georgia. Um, very grateful that you made the time to come along and share your wisdom with us all today. Um, also, thank you to all of you uh, audience members at I'm home. Measuring those in. So um, okay. We've got Jen again. <laughs> She's likely going to stop. She stopped. Okay. Um, we do have a course coming up on this subject matter uh, starting in a couple of weeks, kicking off in early November. So if, uh, if anything that you've seen here piqued your interest and you want to learn more, definitely dive into that. And we've got a special discount for all of our uh, audience members who tuned into the webinar as well. We'll be sending out information about that in the email that goes out, uh, I think, this afternoon or early tomorrow. So thanks again, uh, everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing you back at uh, another webinar of ours down the road. All the best. Bye. And may Bye. the best football team win, whatever that happens to. <laughs> Go Tigers. <laughs>